Lavrov on April 19 revealed in a major interview detailing about how Blinken in an in-person meeting with Lavrov in Geneva on January 21st, 2022, reneged on Biden's undertaking to Putin on December 30th, 2021, that the U.S. has no intention to put offensive strike missiles in Ukraine. When Lavrov talks about these things, what he's trying to say? Well, I happen to believe that Lavrov is telling the truth here. Um, the Russians have been pretty perspicacious, pretty gradual in stating their case. Only, only over the last year or so have they publicized the story about the agreement where they would no go no further, where the Ukrainians and the Russians actually agreed in early April 2022, so two years ago, right? Not to, to have a ceasefire. And the big thing, of course, was Ukraine said, okay, we don't have to be part of NATO. Now, the rest, Crimea, Donbass, that could be that could be talked about later. That was the deal, okay? Now, what happened? The U.S. and the U.K. said, nothing doing, Zelensky. You do that, and we'll, uh, you know, we won't support you at all. You'll be at the mercy of those terrible Russians, okay? Zelensky, a great comedian, a great actor, didn't know any better. And he said, okay, you promised to support us for as long as it takes? Uh, cross our hearts and hopes to die. Yeah, we'll do that, okay? So he made the wrong choice. It was, now, people said, well, that happened. Well, now we have the Ukrainian negotiators, not the Russians, the Ukrainians. And, and these aren't outliers. These aren't dissidents. One of them, Haremia, uh, is uh, the head of Zelensky's political faction in, in the Ukrainian parliament, for God's sake. And he says, yeah, we had this whole thing worked out. And then the Americans and the UK and the person of Boris Johnson came in and said, no, you can't do that. And so Zelensky saluted to them and said no and threw that in the trash can. So that's that's how things kind of peter out. And I always wonder why, why it took the Russians so long to stop calling uh, Western nations like the US and Britain and France and Germany our partners, our partners, our partners. That's a Russian word that means a friendly partner, okay? They no longer are you know, going to use that friendly term. And worse than that, um, things have come to such a pass that they're coming out with more and more detail. Now, this particular set of circumstances interests me greatly, partly because it's not been reported upon in the West. Now, for those of you readers who are interested in this and want to keep it straight, I was going to say you might get a pencil and paper, but that's sort of obsolete. If you have a keyboard there, <laughs> you might want to take this down, okay? So we're talking the very end of December 2021. What happens? Well, things are getting really bad because the Russians have tabled a treaty which would respect their national interests and would preclude Ukraine becoming part of NATO. And the West is not willing to discuss that treaty, okay? Then Putin gets up on the 21st of December and talks to his very high-level four-star admirals, generals, and the defense, uh, defense minister and says, look, we're in a bind here. There are missile bases in Romania and Poland that can accommodate ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, other ballistic missiles. We don't know what's in those. They have caps on them. They're capsules, okay? Now, if there are ballistic missiles in there, in present circumstances, they can reach Moscow in about nine minutes. If, when the Americans finally get them, there are hypersonic missiles put in there, five minutes. Got it? Five minutes. And then Putin makes this terrible mistake. <laughs> it says, now, you officers, we have to have something concrete now. We need some concrete reassurances, like like uh, written, written down things. 
And I could see the the generals and the admirals saying, well, Vladimir Vladimirovich, uh, I mean, thinking, wasn't the ABM treaty uh, written down? Wasn't the intermediate nuclear forces? That was written down to the open sky. That was, Come on, Vladimir Vladimirovich. We need more than that, okay? So what happens? Nine days later, on the 30th of December, the White House gets a call from the Kremlin. Kremlin says, uh, Mr. Putin would like to talk to Mr. Biden uh, right now, please. And the White House says, well, what do you mean right now? I mean, we, we decided to have our negotiators meet in Geneva on the 9th and 10th of the next month of January. So what do you have to talk? Please, Mr. Putin would like to talk to Mr. Biden right now. Well, okay. Biden, to his credit, says, all right, I'll take the call. He takes the call from Putin, and the readout says, get this now, Mr. Biden said that the U.S. has no intention of deploying offensive strike missiles in Ukraine, period, end quote. Whoa, 30th of December, 2021. Okay, next day, New Year's Eve, great rejoicing in the Kremlin. Ushakov, uh, uh, Putin's right-hand person for this kind of thing, is waxing eloquent. He said, you know, finally, finally, the, the, the Americans are taking our strategic interests into, into account. Uh, this willingness to say no strategic strike missiles in Ukraine, that meets five of the eight provisions we had in this treaty that we give NATO and that we gave the United States. This is, this is great. Let's get down to breast tax. So that's New Year's Eve. Now, on the 9th and 10th of January, so 10 days later, when they meet in Geneva, the two delegations of the Russians say, okay, let's get down to breast tax now. Uh, let's, let's talk about no uh, arrangements to make sure that there are no offensive strike missiles in Ukraine, as there could be in Romania and Poland. And the American delegation says, huh? What? And they repeat it, the Russians. Oh, we don't have any instructions on that. No, we, we, where'd you hear about that? Oh, it was in the readout of the Putin Biden uh, talk on the 30th of December. Oh, no, we don't, we don't know anything about that. That's the 9th and the 10th. On the 21st, and this is what's news yesterday, Lavrov uh, talks one on one to Blinken in Geneva. I hadn't known this before, but yesterday in a an extremely well advertised interview with Komsomolska Pravda, uh, Sputnik, and several other agencies, so it was a big deal. Uh, Lavrov says, "Look, I met with with Tony Blinken on the twenty first of January two thousand and twenty two. Now, right, two thousand twenty two, and he said." The U.S. reserves the right to put offensive strike missiles in Ukraine. What are you talking about? The, the president, no, this is, we're not going to talk about that. Of course, my, my people in Geneva are not going to talk about that, and neither am I. So here's, here's, uh, here's uh, Lavrov saying, this is, really, uh, this is really how it went down. Now, he goes into great detail, and maybe that's the, the point here, he talks about, um, look, uh, he says, uh, Mr. Putin at this particular time said, you know, if you, the West and the U.S., uh, object to our putting Iskander type medium range ballistic missiles in Kaliningrad, well, please come look at them. Please come look at them. They're not, they don't have the range that would violate the, inter, in, the, uh, uh, medium range and short range uh, ballistic missile treaty. And then uh, in response, of course, we would like to inspect the missile emplacements that you already have in Romania and Poland. That's what we'd like to do. That's what uh, Mr. Putin said. But our proposal about medium strange missiles, uh, that's, they really fell apart. 
Here's another thing. Uh, the U.S. says we'd be ready to limit their number to three, medium range plus. Well, that wasn't the deal. The deal was that you undertook, Mr. Biden, not to put offensive strike missiles in Ukraine. You already can have them in Poland and Romania, as we said before. And so uh, these details uh, are very, very illustrative of how the, the Russians feel that they can not uh, trust the United States. And uh, when you don't have no, no trust at all, and you could just see those four stars looking at uh, Vladimir Putin and saying, well, okay, good try, Vladimir. Uh, but the, they were... They pulled the wool over your eyes yet again, didn't they? Now, Biden and uh, Putin talked one more time, probably the last time. That was on the 12th of February. So again, the chronology. 30th of December, Putin, Biden talk. At Putin's request, Biden makes that undertaking. Okay, 9th and 10th of January, 2022, you have the delegations meeting in Geneva and the U.S. pretends they didn't ever hear about a commitment not to put medium range missiles in Ukraine. OK, 21st, Lavrov and Blinken. Lavrov said, what's going on here? Blinken said, oh, no, we, we never, we, we're not going to do that. We're not going to undertake not to put missiles in Ukraine. We, we do what we want. OK, so that's the 21st. Now we fast forward to the 12th of February where Biden and Blinken talk once again. The readout from that was Biden refused to talk about any understanding to prevent Ukraine from becoming part of NATO. And he also refused to talk about his former undertaking not to put offensive strike missiles in Ukraine, period, end quote. February the 12th, okay? Now, what happened on February the 24th? Well, we know that the Russians went into Ukraine. Now, it wasn't only this. I mean, the Ukrainians had upped their shelling of the Donbass by a, a geographic, by a, by, I'm sorry, by a, several times, like 15 times as many shells were falling on Donbass starting on the 12th of February, 2022. So that was another proximate reason. Uh, Putin had secured the support of China on the 4th of February, that was another key factor. As I've said always, I don't know if he would, would have gone into Ukraine without knowing that Xi Jinping supported it, okay? So these are all factors, but the, the case at hand shows that it was a direct parallel with a situation that existed 60 years ago. Now, not many people were alive 60 years ago, much less on active duty, which I was, okay? I was on active duty as an Army Infantry Intelligence Officer at Fort Benning, Georgia, okay? Cuban Missile Crisis. What happened? Well, what happened was Khrushchev was persuaded by his generals, hey, let's steal a march on the U.S. Let's put offensive strike missiles, same kind of missiles, medium and intermediate range missiles, in Cuba, Fidel Castro wants us to do that. Let's take advantage of this. And they do it. And what does President Kennedy do? He says, no, this is an existential threat. We're sorry, but we don't. We know that these ballistic missiles can hit Washington, Norfolk, where we have our naval base, or Savannah, or, at, within nine to 10 minutes. Oh, nine to 10 minutes. Yeah. We won't tolerate that. You must take them out. OK, now, Khrushchev and Kennedy had a kind of uh, talking relationship, at least. And they talked it through. And Bobby Kennedy helped by telling Dobrynin, the, the Soviet ambassador, look, we'll take missiles out of uh, Turkey if you take your missiles out of Cuba. So those generals that are breathing down your back of your neck, you could tell them, look, we'll take the missiles out of Cuba. We'll do it quietly, but we'll do it. We promise. Promise? Well, in those days, there was a modicum of trust between Kennedy and Khrushchev. Okay. Now, let, well, so it's a directly analogous situation. Uh, when one country that has nuclear weapons 
sees an existential threat coming that didn't exist before, they're going to do what's necessary to get rid of it. Was it legal? No, it wasn't legal. Blockades are not legal. Uh, trying, preparing to invade uh, another country is dubiously legal. A threatening nuclear war, that's against the UN, UN Charter, okay? It was all illegal, what Kennedy did. But nobody said, oh, President Kennedy, you're overreacting, for God's sake. Cuba is a sovereign country. They have the right to invite whatever they want in terms of missilery or anything like that. You know, so no, nobody said that. So just to finish this up, I mean, the analogy is very apt. What, what else can we say? We could say that a year later, not quite a year later, that was September, October 1962. On June 10th, 1963, President John F. Kennedy uh, made an incredibly moving speech. And what he said in a word was, look, we came close to extinguishing life on the planet. Uh, we want the best for our children. And we're willing to acknowledge that Premier Khrushchev and others want the best for their children. Uh, we want to see if we could get by this animosity. Uh, we're going to do a limited test ban treaty. And uh, look, um, the important thing to take away from all this, says John F. Kennedy, is that what should be prevented in any case, in all circumstances, is uh, giving a nuclear-powered country a choice between humiliating defeat, humiliating retreat is what he said, and using nuclear weapons. Wow, 1963, June 10th, look it up. Now, from that date until Ukraine, the US and Russia, Soviet Union first, were very careful not to give one another or each other a humiliating choice between retreat or using nuclear weapons. But that's what it's come to now. And let me just finish by saying the, the, the Russians are not going to use nuclear weapons first. They don't have to. They're winning in Ukraine. What I fear is that during an election year, when it's clear that Ukraine has won this war, uh, these sycophants, these, uh, uh, these sophomores that advise Biden will say, uh, uh, Mr. President, the only thing we have left is to use a low yield nuclear weapon. And, uh, you know, we can use them. Uh, our military says, you know, but that will give the Russians quite a lesson and maybe it will get us through the election. And maybe we can still win. And maybe then we can win the election. And maybe then we could stay out of jail because each and every one of these guys, Blinken, Sullivan, Nolan, and the president himself, not to mention his son, Hunter, there's a lot of evidence of graft, of, of bribery, and all that kind of stuff. So they have a personal incentive not to lose the war, then lose the election then lose their freedom. Now, I say that uh, because I want people to think about that. You know, the Russians have no need to use a nuclear weapon. Uh, they're winning, for God's sake. The only thing that could reverse it or stop it would be this, this incredibly stupid and dangerous step. And uh, would I put it past the Blinkens and the Sullivans of this world? Unfortunately, no, I couldn't put it past them. So let's cross our fingers and hope that what McGovern says here is just speculation. You tweeted that CIA Director Bill Burns on July 7th, 2023, said that Ukraine is a, is a strategic failure for Russia. Its military weakness laid bare. And right now on April 18th, 2024, he says that Ukraine may lose this year without supplemental assistance. When you look at this kind of view on the part of Bill Burns, who's in this administration, who's part of this policy in Ukraine. And on the other hand, we know that Ukrainians are surrendering at a level 
that we haven't seen before. Even Azov Battalion, these people who are far-right neo-Nazis. And when you put these two pictures together, in your opinion, what's the objective on the part of Bill Burns? He's advocating to send more weapons. What's your take on this? Uh, Nima, we have an expression here in the United States. Uh, when you're when you're buying a used car, you want to kick the tires, right? <laughs> you want to make sure that the car is, is okay. Uh, when Bill Burns says something, you want to kick the tires uh, to see if he's lying. Uh, we had great hopes for Bill Burns because he's one of the few people who's been around and knows something about foreign affairs. Suffice it to say, he became a cog in the wheel of the system. He was ambassador to, uh, to Russia when uh, he was told that if we try to get Ukraine into NATO, the Russians would have to decide whether or not to intervene because it would be a provocation. It would be what they call a red line, okay? And he reported back to the State Department, net means net, red line, Russia accession to NATO. Well, as soon as the Russians invaded Ukraine, he changed his tune and said, oh, it was completely unprovoked, illegal, unprovoked, terrible. So, you know, this is the kind of guy that you don't want to be head of an intelligence agency that tells the truth. Now, more recently, that is last year, on July 7th, 2023, uh, he wrote an article in the Washington Post, and he said, oh, yeah, well, the Russians, uh, Putin, they like to personalize it. You know, Putin has uh, had a strategic defeat. Uh, the inefficiency of his military has been laid bare. Okay. Oh, a direct quote. Now, most people realize by that time, Bill Burns was just singing what the White House wants him to sing. But the real deleterious effect of this, of course, is that six days later, Mr. Biden in Poland says Putin has already lost in Ukraine. He's already lost. Okay. Now, that was July of last year. Now, do the math. Here it is, April of this year. What is Bill Byrne saying now? Oh, Ukraine's going to lose this year if they don't get uh, uh, this supplemental intelligence, uh, this supplemental uh, weaponry or you know, funding. So, uh, so what does that mean? Well, it means that he's a tool of the system. Nobody should believe him. And we used to call that back in the day a budgetary intelligence. You know, you craft the intelligence to make the budget what you want it to be. So it's a prostitution of the intelligence process. And, you know, at a time when you need bona fide people to tell the president what's really going on, you have a, a complete lack of such. Now, there is a titular head of Bill Burns as head of the CIA, and her name is April, Avril Haynes. She's the Director of National Intelligence. Now, what was her take on all this? Well, a half year before Burns said what he said, Avril Haynes was saying, oh, I'm really optimistic about the prospects for Ukrainians succeeding in this counteroffensive to be launched in the spring of 2023. I'm very optimistic. You know why? Because the Russians are running out of ammunition. Yep. And they don't have any indigenous capability to produce the ammunition that they're already expended. So we're sitting pretty, we're sitting, and she said that publicly. Check it out. It's on the national, the, the director of national intelligence website still, okay? Now, how silly does that look? How silly does that look almost two years later? So this is the kind of, of, uh, of intelligence that the president is working with. I mean, it's a real sad pass of events when people who labored in the trenches as I did back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s were able and were 
felt compelled to tell the president the truth. Uh, he could act any way he wanted, but, but God, at least he had one place to turn for what Truman, who set up the CIA, called untreated intelligence. Untreated intelligence is a vanishing species. It started vanishing a couple of decades ago. If the president has nowhere to turn for accurate information, the country is in trouble deep. We know that Tucker Carlson uh, was talking about the Congress, and he said that members of Congress are terrified of the intel agencies. I'm quoting him. I'm not guessing at that. They've told me that including people who run the Intel Committee. And what's the problem when Tucker Carlson talks about these Congress being afraid of Intel agencies? What's the problem there in your opinion and what he's talking about? He's talking about what's commonly referred to as the, the deep state or the national security state. Now, these are the folks that lurk behind the scenes. Uh, they're not elected, but they stay in place from regime or from administration to administration. Um, when Donald Trump came to town in 2000 and, well, 2016 was the election, it didn't take congressperson, senator, uh, Chuck Schumer, two days to ask Rachel Maddow, Rachel, can I come on your show? I have something really important to tell you about the intelligence people. And Rachel, oh, sure, Chuck, sure. So on the 2nd of, of January, uh, 2017, so three weeks before Trump is inaugurated, Chuck Schumer comes on to Rachel. And Rachel said, now, Chuck, you had something to tell me about the intelligence community. And Schumer says, yes, Rachel, I thought that uh, that Trump was a pretty smart businessman, but he's done something very, very stupid, very, very dumb. Oh, what's that, Chuck? He's crossed the intelligence community. He's criticized them. He's crossed them. And, you know, they have six ways to Sunday to get back at him. Very, very silly thing to do. Oh, Chuck, fine, you know. Now, instead of asking Chuck Schumer, what do you mean by that, Chuck? You mean that a president of the United States has to be afraid of the intelligence community? And Chuck Schumer would have to say, well, yeah. <laughs> well, okay. So here is Tucker Carlson saying precisely the same thing. And if I recall that story correctly, he was host to a very, very senior committee chair, I think it was, uh, in, in, in Congress. And he said, what about this? And the, the congressperson or senator, we don't know who it was, said, yeah, that's true. They have all kinds of blackmail. They have all kinds of data on you. I mean, Look at what they scoop up just electronically. So you're very circumscribed to what you can do unless you have a pristine, pure, or unless they can't drum up or fabricate something against you. So that's one hell of a situation to be in. Now, how did that play out? Well, uh, Trump was a real estate guy from New York, right? So he comes down to Washington, I'm reminded of a peanut farmer from Georgia, comes into Washington and thinks he can rely on his Georgian associates to run America. You can't do that, okay? Neither can a real estate guy with a son-in-law and other stuff, okay? You just can't do it, okay? You have to be smarter. So in that sense, Chuck Schumer was a little bit right. What did they do to Trump? They created Russiagate. They created stories such as uh, the the story that uh, the DNC cables, the DNC emails, the Democratic National Committee emails uh, that were released by WikiLeaks had been 
hacked from the DNC computers by whom? What would you, the Russians. By it was the Russians, okay? Now, we had, we had oodles of technical expertise in our group, veteran intelligence professionals for sanity, including two former technical directors of the National Security Agency. And we said, what about this? And they said, it's all, it's all, it's all BS. If, if the Russians hacked, we would know about it. We would be able to serve chapter and verse. Well, we know now that after all this stuff and the New York Times and Washington Post authors getting Pulitzer Prizes for spinning all these yarns, okay, we learned later that on December 5th, 2017, so less than a year into Trump's administration, uh, finally, the House Intelligence Committee got testimony from this fellow, uh, Sean Henry, who is head of uh, CrowdStrike, the firm that the FBI, in its wisdom, hired to lead to the Russian hacking of the DNC. And when they asked Sean Henry, well, tell us about uh, the Russian hacking of the DNC, Sean Henry started out, well, it would, and then his lawyer grabbed him and said, <laughs> you're under oath, you're under oath. And Sean Henry said, we don't have any technical evidence that the Russians hacked into the DNC. As a matter of fact, we don't have any evidence that anybody hacked into the DNC. Now, Americans don't know that. That was December 5th, 2017. Do the math. What's 2024 now, okay? Adam Schiff, the head of the House Intelligence Committee, kept that secret for two and a half years, okay? Then one of Trump's associates said, uh, Mr. Trump, you're president, so you could you could get that released. It's not even classified. Just tell him to release it. And so his intelligence director said, okay, Mr. Schiff, if you don't release that testimony from Sean Henry tomorrow, I'm going to release it. And sure enough, Schiff released it together with about 57 other releases. So it would be lost in the process. Now, that was May, early May of 2000. 20, two and a half, 2020, okay? Now, did the New York Times tell that story? No. Washington Post? No. So what's happening today? Well, you have the, the people that won awards for spinning this tale about Russiagate and Russia hacking. They're at it again. They're saying the Russians are going to interfere in this coming election. <laughs> and people like, Michael Isikoff and David Korn, who wrote this fable about Russian roulette and were one of the most serious offenders of the whole thing, well, they're rising, rising to the fore again. Michael Isikoff saying not only that the Russians are going to hack again, <laughs> does it? maybe, well, of course he knows, okay? But also, you know who did? You know who blew up the pipeline uh, under the Baltic Sea there, the Nord Stream pipeline? It was a Ukrainian colonel. <laughs> so these guys, you know, these guys are being rehabilitated. And how can they be rehabilitated? Well, because the American people are kept from the truth. It's just like, and I feel very close to this, the non-existent weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, okay? Now, we know that the pundits had their, had a, a wonderful experience with this fellow Fred Hyatt, who was op-ed chief of the Washington Post. And before the attack on Iraq, I think it was like 80% of the op-eds were all about, of course there were, of course there were weapons of mass destruction. Not only that, but there were ties between Al-Qaeda and Saddam Hussein. Uh, Soto Voce. So Saddam Hussein had something to do with 9-11. My God. Okay. So what happens? Well, Fred Hyatt is invited up to the Columbia School of Journalism after all this. Okay. 
about two years later. And the, the, student, the student says, Mr. Hyatt, now you kept asserting, and so did all the people you let write for the for the post, um, that it was flat fact that uh, Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. Uh, how, how do you feel about that? And Hyatt said, and this is a quote, well, if there were no weapons of mass destruction there, we probably should not have said that there were, end quote. I won't comment on that. But did Hyatt suffer any consequences? No. He remained head of the op-ed section of the Washington Post for 20 more years. So we get the picture here. No one is held accountable. Not the intelligence officers who prostitute themselves. Not the uh, not the people in the uh, media who feed on on these people. And so, you know, unless people <laughs> unless people watch programs like yours, Nima, or other things that uh, that you interview people on, uh, they're not really able to put all this together. That's why I'm so delighted uh, to be able to be with you. And uh, and to say my truth, not that I pretend that I uh, have a hundred percent truth, but I've been at this a long time, and uh, I have no access to grind. Uh, I'm equally critical of both sides of the uh, of the uh, political equation, and I would just say that uh, it's a sorry matter that we end up with the kind of choices that we're going to have. Uh, in November, by all indications, I just hope that some miracle happens and uh, the landscape changes and we get some people who have some devotion to the truth.